For performing arts organizations, the pandemic has been a curse, but also a creative stimulus. At Hub Theater Company of Boston, that means stretching the boundaries of virtual performance to encompass the unsettling and the unknown. That's the territory explored by Solitaire Suite, a new play by Trent England and directed by Daniel Bork in a production that debuts on February 20th. To tell us about it are the... Uh, Two guests from Hub Theater, the producing artistic director, Lauren Elias, and the leading cast member, Marty Mason. I'd like to thank you both very much for being with us. Thank you for having us, Chris. Always a pleasure. All right. This is a new work, uh, and the topic here, I mentioned a little bit about it, uh, you know, the unknown, the creepy maybe. Uh, what else is going on? What really made us want to do this play right now, in addition to how, you know, how we thought the sci-fi aspect of it would be a lot of fun to do with these new technological tools that we get to slash are forced to use nowadays, is that this play really deals with that moment, that point of no return. And I think that as we approach the one year anniversary, if you will, of this pandemic, I think everyone can sort of point to that moment around this time last year and be like, oh my God, that was the last normal day I had. If I had known, would I have done it differently? Would I have had an extra cup of coffee? Would I have, you know, gone and seen that movie that I didn't really want to see, but just to see friends and stuff? I, I think that it really explores that moment of looking back and knowing that is the moment that everything changed. And I think that that's something that we collectively as a society are able to do right now for better or for worse and i think it's something that we're not able to do so collectively so often marty uh, what lauren describes is is a common experience for all its strangeness uh, did you draw on something like that as you sort of got yourself into this role in the, in the play um i would say uh a lot of becoming a parent feels like that um and i'm a, a new mom um and like when my son was born, things didn't go exactly the way I thought they would. Um, and that was a real um, turning point for me because um, he, he was sick when he was first born and he was in the hospital for a while. And so that was um, really earth shaking and it changed a lot of how I approached parenting for you know the first six months at least. Um, and, uh, and then also becoming a new mom in the middle of a pandemic where, you know, we had planned, he's going to go to daycare three days a week, you know, um, I had changed my work schedule to accommodate that. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's okay, my husband's working from home, I'm working from home for a couple of months too. And all of that, <laughs> you know, all of that changing and shifting. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really, I, I feel like it's not very sci-fi, but it is very, um, it's true that certain things will happen in your family that then you look back on and you think, wow, you know, how would this have been different if, if everything had gone different at this one time? So. I, I read the short story the play was based on, and I'm seeing there these helicopter parents. Of course, they're younger than I am. Uh, and when helicopters are, 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 are involved with kids, I'm thinking they're closely, they're almost intrusively involved. But this is about hovering at a distance, isn't it? In a way, yes. You know, what's so interesting is that, you know, in our play, the unofficial fourth character is this drone, which is also something that if you will, hovers. <laughs> so it's it's a very interesting thing, particularly I think right now with every with parents, particularly in some ways, being much more involved in their kids' day to day lives than normal. I mean, I've heard of friends who have that are home, you know, have their kids doing distance learning, and they're like, "Oh my God, it's all I can do to not scream out the answer for them." or tell them, you know, Sh raise your hand, be participate in the learning, you know? And normally you get eight hours away from your child. You're not really that involved. And so I think it's something that every, all of a sudden this tightness and this closeness and this, the world sort of closing in, in ways that are good and ways that are bad. <laughs> Marty, I'm, I'm looking at the story here, you know, I'm seeing a child who, who's immersed in his uh, smartphone, the glow coming out of the phone here, and 
it's like a lot of us, not just the kids, a, a lot of adults that are, are absorbed in their devices and disconnected, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I um, I feel like that also really spoke to me um, because I have been very conscientious about trying to not be constantly, you know, glued to my phone while I'm with my kid um, because I I work around children and parents and I have seen so often, you know, it's so easy to just get checked out and to just get sucked into your device. And I see kids doing that. I see parents doing that while they're with their kids. You know, there's whole books about it. Like I was reading a book, I think when I was expecting, I was reading a book that was all about, um, you know, this digital culture that we're all living in now and that kids are growing up in and how many new challenges there are related to that. Um, and it's, it's something to think about really at all ages, you know, when do I want my kid to have screen time? Uh, what does that mean for me? Like, do I get to watch my shows? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And it's, um, it seems like a very small thing, but you know, I think every generation has something like this. You know, I know in my parents' generation, it was TV, you know, TV making a difference. Um, and probably that was the same for me. And then, you know, the advent of these computers that you carry around in your pocket with you all day, it's, it's completely changed our relationship to technology in good ways and bad ways, so. Lauren, uh, the, the story is very much about these differences between males and females, even of different generations. But the, the way the story, and it's written by a man, but by the time I got to the end of the story, it seemed to be very much centered in a woman, Celeste, the, the character played by Marty. Uh, uh, how does that get put out, translated into a stage work? Well, Mar as any, when you come to see this show, you will see Marty, there's the, Yokeman's share of the work in this show, you know, most ninety percent of the lines and what have you are all heaped upon Marty's glorious shoulders, and she does a fabulous job with it. So what's really interesting is we really get to know this one character, really get to see this event through her eyes, and see her, the, how it how she transforms very deeply over the course of this play. And I think what's also so and what. What I've always said to people who ask, "Oh, what's this show?" I said, "It's science fiction with a with a healthy dose of social commentary." You know, the idea of listening to women, which I think is unfortunately so timely and continues to be timely. Yeah. What, what about that, Marty? Uh, we we don't want to give away too much uh, of the plot here, but but what do you take from that uh, that message that, that Laura mentioned? You, you got to listen to the women more often and take them more seriously. Um, yeah, I think that that's really true in our society. As Lauren was saying, unfortunately, this is a big problem. Um, I do think it's really, um, it's really interesting to have this be the focus of a, of a play that is written by a man. Um, and I, I appreciate that, you know, I appreciate that Trent decided to write about this problem, um, as a male writer and as a man existing in the world, but acknowledging the fact that this happens all the time, um, whether it's in the workplace, in the family. Um, and it's another thing that's really important right now because I, I know a lot of women have left the workforce. Um, sorry, <laughs> during, during COVID. <laughs> um, because they are expected to be the ones who are home. Um, and I've seen that in my own colleagues. I am fortunate enough to have a husband who's very much a partner um, and we have a very equitable relationship with how we are managing parenting and our careers but um, but I know a lot of people who don't have that and and you know you can't really speak to someone's personal life but you can see this whole situation happening all around that um, women aren't being listened to, women's careers aren't being prioritized. Um, and that's a really that's a really big problem for society in general, I think. Um, Lauren, what, what about um, the effect of this play? Because you know, there are things that people experience in theater and they should be emotional things too. Um, I can imagine watching this and at the end of it, just sort of being <laughs> unsettled. Um, <and then> maybe, <laughs> maybe I've got to talk to somebody I live with 
<laughs> That's what does that say, say about the, the purpose of, of theater, at least? What we're kind of hoping for, what I love about this play is that it's one of those plays that 20 people could watch it at the exact same time, and they're going to have 20 different interpretations about what the ending meant and how it ended. And I think that that's so fascinating, particularly to be able to do something like that um, in a show that's being done at a distance, so to speak. I think that that's just absolutely fascinating. And yeah, it despite it being done through the lens of a computer and what have you, I mean, I know I have a visceral reaction to it every night. Every night I sort of get anxious by the end of it. Now, and you know, we're going into our prod staff meetings. So I'm like, okay, calm down. Everything is fine. We just need to talk tech. Marty is okay. We are breathe. But, you know, even I who have seen this play, you know, going on how many times now at this point, I still have a reaction to it. And I think that that's a real testament to it, the strength of the writing and the strength of the acting. Finally, Lauren, I, I know in ordinary times, we tell people which building to go to to see the play <laughs> and that it would be sort of pay as you can or, or as you desire maybe. But uh, for, for the time being, if people want to plug into this, what do they need to do? All they need to do is sit at, stay at their very own house and go to www.hubtheaterboston.org and tickets are on sale there. And you don't even need to put on pants. You don't need to leave the comfort of your house. I mean, what more could you want out of an evening? Well, thank you both very much for taking the time to give us the preview. <laughs> thank you so much, Chris. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. And nice to meet you, Marty. That is Lauren Elias and Marty Mason from Hub Theater Company of Boston.